The portmaster refused to let us enter the port one night owing to 25 to 30 foot waves breaking against the seawall. We kept two miles offshore due to the considerable risk of accessing the harbor. We sent a rubber zodiac into the water to transport six crew members to Lax. The zodiac could retrieve our submarines and handle a lot, but we were testing a new sub that night without a crew. Even though our mate was Zodiac Savvy, the captain asked me to accompany him because he was unfamiliar with the harbor. We launched the Zodiac into the ocean and headed beach. We just used the harbor buoy and lit coastline for navigation in the dark, but the waters were 25 to 30 feet high and rough. To find the harbor buoy, we climbed a swell, rode the trough to the next, and repeated. We stopped watching the harbor buoy after a while. We planned to land on the beach if we couldn't find the harbor. While driving to the beach, we caught some air off a crested wave. I ordered the mate to turn the ship around after we hit because it was safer at sea. After he turned us around, another wave hit us. It split Zodiac. I tried navigating from the bow. About five men trailed me. I felt like I was dangling precariously over the edge when I was hurled into the water and spun around aimlessly. Instead of swimming, I kept my cool and let the life vest lift me up. As I was thrown around, I could only cling on and protect myself. Even if I'm comfortable underwater as a professional diver, your breath control is limited. When I started feeling excitement, dizziness, and other symptoms, I worried about my wife's financial security and my life insurance because of our training to detect oxygen deficiency. I knew I could only hold my breath so long. Acceleration made me breathe again. After a brief heat rush, I was evacuated. Other drowning survivors say it happens instantly. They leave their host immediately. I was in pitch blackness that seemed to cover everything and nothingness. I was brutally slain by a stormy sea. I suddenly feel calm. I'm calm despite the darkness since it's silent. I felt warmer after swimming in freezing water. I wanted to know what was going on in the silence. No education prepared me for this. A little light caught my attention, and I headed there. Growing closer, it looked like a swarm of tiny lights or millions of pieces. They moved in harmony like a swarm of birds unexpectedly shifting flight paths. These luminous specks give a wonderful glow when they overlap in a kaleidoscope of colors. I felt affection, like a warm hug, as I got closer. Everything left me speechless. Feeling like I was floating in midair, Lured to the light, I looked in the mirror. I found it interesting that I had eyesight and could concentrate it in any direction despite having no head or eyes. I felt like I was dissolving into a light speck. As we approached, three pieces parted and approached me as if to say hello and farewell. I was astonished and humbled by these three welcoming me home. I was shuffled between dysfunctional families. Despite her best efforts, my biological mother's connections were terrible. Feeling like I belonged to a spiritual family was deeply meaningful. I met dozens of these beautiful entities that welcomed me home. I was emotional. Our unsaid agreement allowed us to communicate. As we plummeted into the light, I realized we were entering a spherical realm. We replayed my life in this huge bubble. With my spiritual family, I relived my life through everyone I'd met. It felt like my mind had split into a million pieces. It was amazing in every detail. My attention then turned to details. The life evaluation showed me that not everything I was proud of, like becoming the chief engineer of a research vessel in my mid-twenties, was essential. My activities were most powerful when motivated by love or connection. I was a bold young man who lived by the concept of cutting a gash through it. When I discovered this about my life, I felt ashamed that my soul family had to see my harsher parts. They loved me supported me, and wanted to be part of my life during this re-experiencing, not judge me. We realized it had nothing to do with my past after reviewing my life story. I felt lost, yet my soul family loved me. Walking down a hallway, we descended. Once we crossed that point, the life review became as hazy as a hallway where you could see every feature up close, but nothing farther out. I've come to call this blurry space our agency. We will return to our life path even if we change it, we choose how to get there and can take advantage of any curveballs. Juice can be extracted from life. Finally, the light spoke to me. This is not your time. You must return. These countless shards sang out in accord. I said, no way. I know the body is hurt. 
I would prefer not return. It was freezing for me. Life was hard, and that corpse was chilling. I argued with God. I have a family I didn't know I had and in love like never before. I don't want to return to that shattered body. Another time, the light spoke like a parent. It replied, you must return, you have a purpose. On the other side, there's a broad consciousness. Thus the light's phrase, purpose, resonated with me. I accepted its efficiency and simplicity. After accepting this, I felt released from my body. I was still being tossed and tumbled in the waves as zodiac wreckage, especially the bow line, began to round my arm. Waves lifted the zodiac and tautened the cord around my arm. It yanked me up after dislocating my shoulder. How can this little thick body hold my huge light beam? As I watched, I pondered. As more waves crested, I thought of this. My body was trapped in the rubble and pressed against it when they did. As the waves hit me, seawater rose to the surface. I buzzed when a soul family member gently put me back into my body. I thought, wow, when we return, we're mixed up. As I struggled to stay present, purpose, 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 ran through my mind. I was losing my footing despite my survival instincts. Despite my broad awareness, I felt like I was vacillating. I realized my life vest was broken. Unclipping it revealed a World War II May West that resembled a giant orange fluffy cushion. The saltwater soaked dry rotted liner oppressed me. Removing my steel toed boots and life vest made staying afloat easier. Thank goodness my teammates, who were holding a flashlight, were looking for me because seawater had left me unable to speak. I was found, and we swam the last mile to the coast. That night was rough. When we landed, I was hyper-rare and hypothermic and shocked. I was in that conflicting state. We treated my thumb and shoulder on the beach, then returned to the harbor and my house. I tried to tell my first wife about my encounter or death. I said, Hun, I think I died. Sharing this with her would make her uneasy and afraid, so I didn't. My team and I avoided death because we explored underwater and depended on each other daily. I couldn't tell anyone and kept asking, what just happened? After that meeting, looking into someone's eyes revealed their brightness, their particle of light. I was used to being angry and belligerent in discussions, so it was hard and intrusive. It suddenly got too obtrusive, witnessing their light fragment would prevent that. I felt like I shouldn't view its essence without permission. This made it hard to resume eye contact. I also sensed life force energies. With no idea what a aura was, I saw life force energy. Such thoughts were strange to me as an engineer. This whole thing worried me because I wasn't paying attention. Return my entire life. California palm tree auras were so beautiful that I exclaimed, Wow, look at that. The next day, we returned to the shore, and I could feel the earth's breath. Though the storm was lessening, the sea was still raging. I couldn't explain it as I stared into the distance and practically felt the earth's respiration. I ignored it since I was lonely and had no one to talk to. I could handle life review, love, and acceptance. It was real. I couldn't shake them. I wanted to disregard them, throw them in a dark corner of my mind, tape them up, and post a big do not touch sign, but life teaches you better. I tried to hide my emotions since it was so scary. I focused on what mattered. First came acceptance. Watching that life review in your mid-twenties helps you define yourself. I saw some things I liked, but most were hideous. I figured I should accept this as my current self and improve on it. The second part was tolerance. I was quite intolerant. I focused on myself and my goals. People often tried my patience, but thinking back on my life, I notice how many people we meet and how we interact with them. Sometimes we disagree with people's choices, but we must accept their freedom to live. After this, I can accept others and my own life choices. A change was possible, I knew. Realizing one's reality, loving oneself, and tolerating others' life choices were crucial. I concluded that as an engineer, I saw things in striking contrast. I was in a rainbow universe now. I realized there is objective truth and soul-level truth. Every personal truth touches our heart, grows us, and guides us through life. I survived 11 years on acceptance, tolerance, and honesty. This wasn't shared at the time. I experienced more after that. 
This second encounter made me experience the first life review and 11 years afterward. I realized my growth. Before adopting truth, tolerance, and acceptance, I didn't think I'd changed much. My second interaction underlined my need to apply my new understanding. I had changed. I had to accept that my soul family is attempting to attract my attention. One benefit of the initial encounter was receiving knowings or information without a clear source. Like a good engineer, I tested it for accuracy and reliability, and it passed. Over 11 years, I learned to trust my instincts. After the second encounter, spirit communicated more. I heard, saw, and saw visions with astounding knowings. I realized they were my spiritual relatives spreading my message. They have various names. I'm not picky. People call them guides or angels. I have to accept these spiritual encounters' holistic character and appreciate their own flavors, talents, and traits. After the second meeting, life improved. This was my quiet ministry. Instead of sharing my experiences, I tried to live by what I learned. This technique worked until I faced a life-changing diagnosis, fourth stage bone, and lung cancer. Cancer eroded 2.5 bones causing my thoracic spine to collapse. Metastases were found in my hip, brain, kidneys, and spine. They only gave me powerful pain meds because the collapsed spine was so severe and progressing quickly. They had no intention of treating me. However, it was like seeing how I've influenced others throughout my life. The years 1983 to 1994 saw several spiritual awakenings till 2000. This event strengthened my spiritual mission, allowing me to become my dream self. I was able to treat myself and share my findings with others, balancing holistic and conventional methods. My calling is fulfilled, and I may follow it. Thanks for watching my video from today. Follow the directions in the description to create a successful YouTube channel like this one. Look forward to your appearance in the next issue.